Um, I want to start off by just asking for a big round of applause for all the speakers and the organizers and for Michael. <laughs> Especially for the cotton candy. I think that was cotton candy fuel <laughs> applause there. Um, my name is Scott Kirchner. Uh, I'm a columnist for the Boston Globe. I write a column on Sundays called Innovation Economy and also blog for uh, Boston.com. And uh, it's really exciting to be here uh, as part of WordCamp Boston, particularly with these uh, two gentlemen, uh, David Weinberger uh, on my left and Doc Searles on my right. Uh, last year was the 10th anniversary of the Food Train Manifesto, which was a really visionary uh, book. Uh, can you raise your hand if you uh, were uh, on the Clue Train Manifesto website if you read the book in uh, 1999? All right. <laughs> I just said 1999, not since then. I'm sure everyone else has read it since then. So what I want to do is just kind of ask a couple questions about Clue Train and then also what, what David and Doc are working on right now. I'll give you the very brief introductions. Uh, Doc is senior editor for Linux Journal. Uh, he's a fellow at the Berkman Center at Harvard, where he heads uh, Project VRM. Uh, and he's working on a new book called The Intention Economy, What Happens When Customers Get Real Power. Um, and uh, David is also a fellow at the Berkman Center at Harvard. He's editor of the great blog, uh, Joho, the Journal of the Hyperlinked Organization, which I think has been a blog since maybe even before Clue Train. 19 it's been an email newsletter Something since like, yeah, the late 90s. The name's been around longer than Earlier blogger. Yeah, all, both of our blogs are close to trained by a very short distance. But David had a newsletter blog for a long time before that. All right. So I, I, I should mention, I should mention your books too. Uh, Everything is miscellaneous and small pieces loosely joined, which uh, come after Clue Train Manifesto. Uh, the I guess the thing I wanted to start with is when you look back at Clue Train, and I, I kind of feel like it was the original. We're seeing all these books now that are kind of guides to social media and how the internet is changing uh, interactions, uh, particularly between companies and customers. And this was really the original one of those books. Uh, you know, the first uh, the first tenet of the Clue Train manifesto was that markets are conversations. And I guess what I'd ask is that you know you had this somewhat utopian vision of how the internet was going to change relationships between people, uh, between people and media, between people and, uh, you know, people and companies, corporations. What, what hasn't proved, maybe what has proved most true and what has proved least true uh, about Clue Train? Well, I, th I think it's become a, a utopia for social media consultants. Uh, there's certainly, there's, how, many people, how many people here are a social media consultant of some sort? Or, or, or aspire to be one. Or aspire to be one. <laughs> um, yeah, it, we had a, I, I think a realistic, and now I think a somewhat more utopian notion of what the net was and what the net did. Um, it was this amazing new environment that created um, endless opportunity for everybody and everything. Um, and right at the height of the dot-com boom, um, we were, we, that is, a lot of big companies, a lot of VCs, and a lot of small companies funded by VCs, basically tried to replicate what became, came before the, the web. You know? Let's advertise a lot. Let's create malls on the web and stuff like that. And uh, and we felt that that the net was so much uh, more opportune than that. So there was so much more that could be done with it that wasn't being done, and it wasn't being understood very well. And so it was basically a rant about that. And it started as a website. It was a website that came out in in, uh, in spring of 1999. Um, and we we wanted to be like Martin Luther, just tack up 95 theses and on the door of the web, and, and we called it a manifesto because that worked for Marx. Um, and, uh, and, we, uh, you know, and we just wanted to sort of test whether or not the things we thought were true um, resonated at all, and they did. So, and then the, you know, the book followed and came out early next year, just in time to cause the crash. <laughs> you take credit for having caused the... We've been given credit for causing the crash. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let it take it. I actually had stock in itself, so uh, I wouldn't say it was especially visionary art in that respect. Okay. Well, what feels least... What feels sort of... So, so let me tell you what I think was right about it. Okay. Right? Uh, I, mean, there, I think there are a bunch of things that were actually right about it, including the fundamental thing, which is, as Doc says, this, think back to 1999, those of you who, you know, were... Out of the womb? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and in 1999, there were a bunch of people who were on the web. It was a little, a little bit harder to be on the web. You had to be, and so it skewed a little more, it skewed geekier than it does now. 
Uh, but most of the media coverage, at least seen to us, um, was focused on web as a business opportunity, which obviously it is, but to repeatedly hear that the web is so exciting because now people can do catalog shopping online was a little discouraging, since those of us who were on the web, and there's a lot of us at the time, uh, uh, knew that it was more than that. So what I think was fundamentally right about Q-Train was to say, no, it's not only about business. Business sort of comes after, it's going to have to perform itself to the web. And I think it was also right, and this is, we, we felt that we were simply articulating what people already knew. So if I say this is right, I'm not claiming prescience. It was sort of backwards looking. We were being observational. Uh, what was also right, I think, about it was that um, the web is best understood as a way that people connect with one another to do the things they want to do. It seems completely obvious, but it's not obvious if you're coming out of a publishing background where the web looks like a place where you can post up at the time sort of e-paper versions of what you were doing on, on regular paper. And it wasn't obvious if you were a business and you saw the web primarily as a market. So the simple idea that the web, the internet, is a place where people get to talk in their own voice and connect with other people um, because they want to was, um, I think, fundamentally right. And still is right. It's not such a great observation, but it's the right observation. So I think, I think that still holds. Well, what, do you, what do you feel that you got wrong, or what has changed in a way that uh, maybe you didn't expect or hasn't been entirely, uh, you know, entirely well, positive? Bunches and bunches of things. For one thing, uh, uh, Thesis 74, I believe it was, which was wrong. As soon as, as, soon as we put it out there, like two weeks afterwards, yeah. they did a whole uh, farted slap. It's 73 or 74 that says, advertising doesn't work, just forget it. Advertising really, really works well. And we have a lizard portion of our brain, and it just responds to advertising. So that was just flat out wrong. Yeah, I was trying to think of what were Google's net profits that they announced yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, other, the really broad thing that I think we were mistaken about, and there may well be others, but the one that sort of um, we were, I think, deeply wrong about is that we were, I think, too techno, I'll speak for myself, because it's written in chapters that are independent. So. Um, I, I was too techno-determinist. I had too much of a sense that uh, the revolution has happened, the technology, people will respond to the technology in the way that the technology wants them to. It's a technology of openness, et cetera, and, and of difference that is connecting with different opinions and different points of view and different cultures. And it turns out that uh, technology really doesn't determine our reaction to it, at least not entirely. And so um, if you just throw the technology into the world, we will not do enough connecting with people who are unlike us. And that's not the technology's fault. That's the seems to be the human brain's fault, that we have a natural, uh, at least deeply enculturated uh, preference for staying with people who are like us. And that sort of uh, self-imposed insularity is very dangerous and means that we're not taking full advantage um, of the technology that we've made for ourselves. So I, I think we were too sanguine about the inevitable um, process, the progress that we will be making, especially in the light of some of the political things that have happened that threaten the very architecture of the, the net, which Blue Train did not foresee. I, I want to just kind of touch on two, two or maybe three other areas and then open it up to your questions, because I'm curious what's on your minds. Um, particularly after this very jam-packed day of, uh, of conversation. You know, Twitter, when I look at that, Twitter is this very conversational technology, right, that is about sort of open messages bouncing back and forth that are, that are by, by nature very public. When I look at what companies have tried to do with Twitter, you know, many of them do get it right, you know, that they are there responding to complaints or customer service issues or, um, you know, people criticizing the product in a, in a valid way. But I, I wonder if something like that scales in that, you know, once you get, once a company gets 500,000 or 5 million or, you know, one day 50 million Twitter followers, if they're still going to be responding individually uh, in this conversational realm or if it's going to become much more like the telephone where it's like, tweet one if you have an issue with, you know, <laughs> your uh, PCR, tweet two it's, if you have should patent it quick. It's a, it's yeah, a IGR for Twitter. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, though, that like when a medium, oh, yeah. when, a, when a communication channel like that is new, you can you can be human and you can be conversational in it, and to some extent with blogs too. I mean, at a certain point, your blog gets too popular and you can't read or respond to every comment. I mean, is that is that sort of uh, at the at the just at the the nature of these new communications technologies? Well, it, my belief is that it's still real early. You know, the 
the, the web as we know it has been around for 15 years, the net not much longer than that. Um, it's still early, it's really early. And I see, I see Twitter as a really great effort that's probably going to get replaced in time. Uh, it has several problems. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, as it works. I use it a lot. There are a lot of followers. I don't know who the hell they are, but there are a lot of them. Um, <laughs> you try to respond to everyone oh, who, God, no. who asks you? Yeah. No, 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 I don't. Um, but the, but I, that's not what I, to me, that's not what it's for. To me, it's like, I found something interesting in the show. That's it. That's a, you know, I'm a, link, I'm a linky tweeter. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I try, I, I rarely publish a tweet that doesn't have a link in it. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 you, I guess I'm wondering about the direct message thing because there's an interesting phenomenon now where like direct message for a lot of people has become like the highest priority message that they get over the course and, and, of the and, day. And for some people, is that I think in part, because I mean, I know a number of people, including myself, for which it is the, it's it's high priority in that it's the most unusual, okay? So we're all inundated with email. Uh, we don't use IM much anymore, or at least not the way that we used to, even though they're great um, open protocols. So Jabber is a great protocol. They probably could be used for tweeting, for that matter. The problem with Twitter is that it's owned. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not public infrastructure. Email is essentially public infrastructure. It, SMTP, IMAP, POP3, these are open protocols introduced by the IETF uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a nice, geeky way that anybody can use. I could take, I could put my mail on Gmail and take it back off Gmail and put it somewhere else. It's mine, mm -hmm. right? I can't do that with Twitter. Yeah. That's a fundamental problem, okay? Google's been more respectful of that, I think. Um, and in the long run, I think Twitter probably will end up there. Uh, they probably don't want to move that fast because they have to follow Dave Weiner, who's been beating it up all over the place, with good cause, I should say. And so, so I, again, the first thing is I, I, I think it's early. And the second thing is I think it's a, um, uh, there's a problem with, with mistaking private, uh, popular private services for public infrastructure. We haven't, and the, so the third problem is we haven't built out the public infrastructure mm -hmm. that we need there. So that's a, an issue. You, I have a, a different question for you, unless you have some burning thoughts about Twitter and kind of where that's taking us. I, I will yes. put out my burning thoughts. <laughs> 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 and Steve will run. They're gone. Okay. <laughs> what about, um, so a lot of companies purport to sort of have gotten the religion about, uh, about social media. And uh, yet there's still like a lot of times when you read a company's blog or you see a CEO who's on YouTube, you know, who suddenly has his own YouTube channel, like you just feel like there's a real authenticity void there. You know, like it's, it's just the 21st century of like Lee Iacocca being on TV and saying like, you know, Chrysler's a great company, buy our cars, but it happens to be on YouTube. So like, is there any way, is there, is there any way that gap can be closed between, you know, no. Okay. No, I, it's a problem. This is, first of all, it's the problem with the term authenticity, which is another thing that I think we, I'll, I'll say got wrong in Clue Train. That is, Clue Train talks about authenticity, and, and I forgot about that, and I looked back on the 10th anniversary, and I was surprised. It's not a term I'm really comfortable with when it, at all, but especially when it applies to companies. So I'll bring us, the answer back to Twitter. So uh, your question about Twitter, which was, um, you know, suppose it goes to 50 million. Um, Twitter is amazing. Um, in a, in a way that the web and the internet also is amazing. Namely, it works at every scale. So Twitter works if you got, have two followers and they're your best friends. It works if you have 50, if you have enough that it's sort of one way and the recommended links. It works for that. It works for 50 million if you're going to do announcements. But it's different at each scale. And the web's like that also. It's one of the only mediums, the only other medium I can think of that works at every scale uh, is writing. You can write a note or you can write uh, you know, something that sells 50 million copies. It's a very unusual capability, and it's one of the reasons why Twitter works so well, and why the net overall works so well. The problem is that authenticity doesn't work at every scale. So if you're talking with somebody in tech support and over Twitter, um, and she's responding, and she's being a human being, you know, that, there's a sense of there where you can talk about authentic, or no, that person really seems insincere, or just company line. It makes sense there. As you go up the scale, Authenticity has to be different at each of those scales, and we don't know how to do it. And it's mm -hmm. not Twitter's fault, and it's not even the poor CEO's fault. The CEO just doesn't know, because we don't have rhetorical conventions for this. How do you talk intimately to 50 million people? Mm -hmm. Should you make fun of yourself? Because that seems to work pretty well, but is that authentic? I don't know. It's something. It's all rhetoric, which is fine. Rhetoric in a good sense. I mean, it's a way that human beings figure out modes of communication and discourse, and we are very good at some of them, talking to one another, mm -hmm. giving a speech. 
and it'll, these new scales that we have, yeah. we don't have we don't have rhetoric developed for it, so there's no possibility of being authentic. It, so I actually feel terrible for companies that now have to face working at every scale that in media that didn't exist five years ago. Uh, that it you know could take us in an entirely different direction. So maybe you want to follow up on that in some of your questions. The one last thing I want to touch on is just kind of. The question of like civility in comments and conversations online, and it always—you oh, always bring that up, you bastard! <laughs> Read what it's it only the response I expected. Uh, you know, it's this question of like we're all trying to spark. If you have a blog, you're trying to spark conversation on your blog, and you're so excited when you have those posts that have ten or hundred, you know, or more comments, and yet a lot of times, you know, the conversation can trend towards that name calling, you know, lowest common denominator, uh, you know, thing. And, you know, do humans just, when we have conversations, and, you know, I, you know obviously when, when we have conversations and alcohol is involved, things tend to veer off in the wrong direction many That's times. But, but, but I was going to say, when you have conversations like in blog comments, a lot of times they tend to veer off into that same uncivil, you know, so, schoolyard direction. So, so, so you, yeah. Have you seen the greater internet fuckwad theory? Okay, look it up, Greater Internet Fuckwad Theory, and it's a wonderful cartoon that has, you know, normal person plus internet plus anonymity equals this, you know, guy with, who's making a face, right? Um, I, I'm not troubled by it. I, I, think it's, I think it tends to show up where people, where, where not serious stuff is going on, for the most part. Um, I, I'm more concerned about the kind of, you know, things like the kind of, like right now, the FCC has done a wonderful job of trying to be as transparent as possible. They've, they've got uh, sites where you can post ideas you'd like to share with them. And then there's a lot of ballot stuffing by the amen corners of one side or another side. Mm -hmm. And and we haven't worked that one out yet. You know, that and yet that may that may influence policy so. Um Which you know, the, the, people people defacing stuff is just is as old as human beings. I was gonna ask what's your experience been or what's your relationship been like with the commenters on your it's blog? totally great. I mean I, I have no problem with them at all. They're, I mean they're they they almost always add value. Uh -huh. Um there are no Doc Searle's tweeters who are just kind of constantly, you know, you know injecting a comment into every there post. there there has been the opposite of an amen quarter, and I almost, I always seek them out and embrace them, honestly. Because uh -huh. uh, sometimes the, the criticisms are very good. And at the very least, what you discover is that, you know, unless they're anonymous, you just don't know who they are. Um, uh, you know, they're human beings, and they have things to say, and I'm interested in what they say. But, but the kind of blogging I do is not especially controversial. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 in, it, it's intellectual, or it's humorous, or it's about photography, or something else that's hard to disagree with. You know? Is a good photo or not? Who, you know, geez, it's a real piece of shit. Nobody ever says that. You know, that's what to look at. So I think the same is true with David. Um, yeah. So we're not probably not good examples. Right. And that's that's uh, we're elderly blogging gentlemen. It's afraid so. Blogging elderly. We try to get young every once in a while. But, uh, yeah. it, it's um, it's something that, that that we all socially engineer against. On our sites, by having policies, or we'll kick people, or we'll do whatever we have to in order to get it to the level that we think is useful and appropriate. Well, can you talk about that? Like, what are the ground rules that you have created to kind of get the, you know, get good discourse in the comments, as opposed to? And the other way that we do it is by not going to the places that are full of invective that we're not interested. In. I mean, sometimes a good, good brawl is sort of fun. Um, so. I'll, a lot of the, again, it's because of our, our demographic, I think, but um, a lot of the policy is actually conveyed through implicit metadata. The site covers a certain sort of thing, and we speak in a certain tone of voice. Uh, so uh, it's not, uh, we don't feel like we have to put up a big warning statement saying, no, racism, homophobia, or bad language will be tolerated, although I would do that if I had that problem. Mm -hmm. um, so we have sort of implicit policies, and if we needed to, we'd post... Um, it's a problem that we all worry about, but then we also pretty much all pretty much all seem to control. But the issue is in those environments where the controls are lacking, either for technical reasons or more likely because of the you know, kids. Uh, you know, it's the social ethos. It's the um, it's what happens, and if that there can be uh, both vicious and because they're more vulnerable, worse. Mm -hmm. um, so. Generally, we control it. It's in the areas where we can't. 
All right, maybe maybe I'm more interested in that in that comment topic than uh, than you guys are because whenever if you ever see an article on Boston.com from the Globe, you know if you it's an article about Scott Brown or Martha Cochlear, or, you know Barack Obama, you instantly get 300 comments that you know just mm -hmm. sound exactly like talk radio callers. Yeah, if I get, if I get three or four. <laughs> comments, if you, if you couldn't long, cut so. talk radio call, callers off, that's what it would, would sound like. Um, I'd love to hear some uh, some questions from you. Um, you know, maybe related to some of the topics that have been discussed earlier today. Well, on that, New York Times, I think, is, what do you think about that model for commenting on in articles? Because I, it's evolved over, I've watched it for the last 12 years. You know, it started off from that kind of fist fight in flames to, to something that maybe called... You know, if you comment on the New York Times, they're sort of selecting comments to post onto the page, I think. No, I mean, you can My post... understanding is there's a human being involved that screens the comments. It's um you can uh, moderate. It's moderated. You know, selects. You can post. No, anyway, it does. It is uh, moderated, so they review it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty much the, the the discourse. You know, the rules are set out. But then you know you can rate it, and uh, they have editor selects, reader selects, and I mean, it's interesting. You think that's a good model? Yeah. So the the White House um, Beth Milvick, who was or is, I think she's on maternity leave, was. It, uh, in the White House, though, the Obama White House, the Office of Technology Over and Policy, OTLT, something like that. Anybody know? Uh, OTS. Anyway, and so she, um, she's a big eGov person, um, and decided, as soon as she got there, that we should, let's um, have an open site where we can together, we all can develop uh, open government policy. And so she put up a site where people could uh, post ideas, and it goes to the next phase, and the next phase, and finally people are actually writing policy together. And in that first phase where people posted ideas, um, there was a tag cloud. And if you check the tag cloud, anybody want to guess what the number one tag was for open government policy? Marijuana. So, Marijuana is an excellent guess, but it's not right in this case. Nazi. Again, very close. <laughs> Birther. Um, Another one was usurper. Now, this was not a site about does Obama have a birth certificate? This is an open government. And, but it's the White House, so you cannot say we're going to kick people off because we don't like what they're saying because it's off topic. Or at least it's a little difficult to do that. They would be accused. It's a democracy. It's supposed to be free speech and that sort of thing. So the site relied upon community moderation in order to set those birther comments are all still there. The UFO was also big. Those birther, com <laughs> um, those birther comments are still there. The UFO stuff is still there. The usurper is there. Uh, but it's been mo moderated down by the uh, by the crowd, and it worked uh, surprisingly well. So if there's a case where you, New York Times owns its site, it doesn't have to worry about uh, free speech issues. You know, it's it's their site. The White House does, and this community moderation actually worked, and it's worked in, in large part because uh, Beth Novick set up the infrastructure correctly, the rules and and the, <coughs> the tools correctly, so that they got a worthwhile site out. Which is always, as you know, is a social engineering conversation, always tricky, difficult, a lot, a lot of little manipulation. The one thing I would respond to just as someone who does blog for like a established media site is that it frustrates me that, and it, this is maybe something that would be solvable with you know, half a day of good programming, but you know, it frustrates me that comments are always relegated to the, the end of the article and sometimes you can't even see them unless you click on the word comments or the number of comments. And to me, I just feel like, you know, it'd be a really interesting editorial feature to say, I'm going to pull out, you know, if I'm the writer of a column or an editorial or, or whatever, I'm going to pull out what I think of as the best 10 comments about this article or the comment that I choose to respond to and have a little dialogue about and, you know, not make it a subsidiary thing to the article, but make it, you know, put it on equal footing. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, anonymity and authenticity. Do you sense any kind of broad changes going underway in that, I mean, we used to be very, everything used to be anonymous, everybody just had a handle, you didn't know who they were, and now people are identifying themselves more and more and more. Is is that a trend you see cons continuing? Uh, I'll take that real quick. This is an area that's totally not worked out. Um, there have been people working on digital identity, uh, uh, for already a long time, and it's a completely unsolved problem. Partly because we want to, you know, in, in this environment, a real-world environment, we walk around more or less being anonymous. We are just a, a person who gets off the subway, you know, we're just another face there. 
Uh, and we need we need that. You know, one of the curses of celebrity is that you lose that anonymity, essentially. Um, I've done a lot of work with, with digital identity. I was one of the organizers of the Internet Identity Workshop and, 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 and keynoted digital ID world for a number of years. And um, one day my wife asked me about it. She said, well, what the hell are you doing with this? And, you know, she's not very technical. And I told her all the things were going on with it. And she said, I want less identity. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm used to being anonymous. I want to be anonymous when I go on and turn that on and off. I want that to be the default rather than you know, something I give up. And we have not worked that out yet. I'm not sure it can be worked out. Um, I have some degree of optimism about it. I think it has to. We need technology that, that starts with the individual rather than starts with an intermediary. In the, in the identity world, we've talked about something called identity providers, and I think we go off the rails right there. As soon as Facebook is giving me my, my identity, or Google or anybody, and they're my intermediator, it's a problem. And until we get the individual backing control of that, if we possibly can, it's going to stay a problem. A, a, a brief. Um, well, three or four years ago, Ethan Zuckerman, who was also at the Berkeley Center, and I wrote a draft of a paper about a call for anonymity as a default, arguing that that's what we've done. And uh, the back half of it said, you know, and if you wanted to strip anonymity out, not have it be the default, here's a list of ridiculous science fiction-y things you have to do to the internet to, make, to take anonymity away. For whatever reason, we, we didn't pursue the article. But three or four years later, every one of those things, which we thought were just ridiculous, it would never happen are either happening or threatening. Hillary Clinton's speech on Thursday, um, which I thought was fabulous, I mean, the Secretary of State proposing freedom to connect as a fundamental human right is pretty awesome. The one bit that sort of stuck in my craw was her defense of, of course we have to crack down on intellectual property thieves um, by taking away anonymity. Hmm. Um, this was her, this was her sort of, uh, formalizing the, the criticism of China yes. over there. Well, this was the her major policy address on mm -hmm. freedom. Yeah. China, obviously, is a background to this. But it was broader than China. It was, very, it was a broad, sweeping speech, and that was the piece that really seemed to me to be wrong. So the very first question for the audience was, well, you just talked about the importance of, percent, of protecting political dissent. How do you do that if you take away anonymity? And she said, well, you have to strike the balance. You can't strike the balance. You can't say, well, we're going to give tools to the world, including China, and elsewhere, um, the tools they need to track down MP3, people are downloading MP3s, but they will not be able to use those same tools to track down people who are downloading um, Fulong God stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. As far as I know, if I'm wrong, I'd be happy to find out about it. But as far as I can tell, you take away anonymity, you take away anonymity. Um, so this would just be sort of, uh, sort of you know, guff coming in a political speech, but there's lots of activity that aimed around the world aimed at taking away anonymity. And we should be paying attention, for example, to ACTA, ACTA, Worldwide uh, um, Policy and, Standard. And counterfeiting uh, something. Yeah. yeah. Um, that is uh, being in the works. It's a secret treaty. We don't know what's in it, but it can't be good. Yeah, those are not the best kind of treaties out there. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah. Well, actually, that sort of touched on my question, which was about privacy. Um, my main question is, do you think the new status quo with not so much being, using discretion on the networks that you sign up and the discretion with who, as far as what information you share. Do we have to start looking at privacy in terms of a commodity that we essentially barter in exchange for services? Anonymity is not always a solution, for example, photo sharing. If I post a photo of myself, even if I post it under an anonymous handle, it still depicts me. Now that data is more than just identity. Um, is that the way we need to start looking at it? Uh, do we just have to give up on privacy? I, I don't think we should give up on anything. Um, again, I think it's really early. Um, and the, the, the fights we need to be fighting are the ones that David just talked about, where, where the thing that we understand is the net uh, shifts from becoming something where all of us are in control of our own lives and the way we participate in it to something that's TV 2.0 or phone system 2.0. And the fact that most of us get the internet through a cable or a phone company and they are in charge of that, and the internet appears as gravy on our TV bill, and it's sold as the third act in a triple play, and that these people have uh, enormous influence in Congress, including the White House, um, to me is a, a more primary and, and proximal concern than um, you know, whatever technologies we might be able to create in order to 
preserve privacy, uh, even though we should care about that. I think everybody should obsess about the things that they're obsessing about. But in the meantime, there are these other, these other. We wouldn't have Wikipedia without this. Okay, we wouldn't have a lot of great stuff without this. But there's, there are, um, to me, there's sort of like bigger, bigger issues. It's kind of like, you know, we're, we build parts of this thing on sand, and the storms will come through. And we'll lose it. Yeah. Question up here. The one thing I want to ask is, do you feel? I mean, is there still? Um, do you have any concerns left over around what was kind of a big discussion in 2009 about sort of the, you know, are bloggers corruptible when, uh, you know, Dell sends them a free laptop or uh, Nokia sends them a free cell phone and there was, you know, I think there are still some questions about, um, you know, is that really always getting disclosed even now that the FTC has weighed in? Like, do you still feel like there's some gray area there about our, you know, what bloggers should and shouldn't do with, Free stuff, free trips. I have three areas, so sure. Um, but the <coughs> uh, growing acceptance of transparency as a norm um, gives me hope. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that seems to me to be the only way that we'll find our way forward. And, and people are corrupt. I mean, everybody's corrupt in one way or another. We're corruptible creatures. That's just the way we are. And, um, and so maximum disclosure. That sounds like an admission that you took the free laptop, Dave. I wish I could offer the free laptop. Yeah, I, 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 Dan Gilmore and uh, J.D. Lassie have put up a list of, I think it was six principles for citizen journalism. Um, I think it's at the, either you know, one of those, one of Dan's, one of Dan's uh, sites. And, and they're the ones that apply to journalism in general. They yeah. basically surface those things. Transparency, full disclosure, you know, stuff like that. And, and to me, it's a common sense thing. I mean, you get a freebie and you write about it, you disclose it. And you say, I got a freebie. I'm writing about the freebie. Um, and and it's to me, that's not a complicated thing. Yeah. And, and that's not a big issue. Yeah. And, and bloggers, I mean, what's happened is that everybody's a journalist <clears throat> now, and a lot of people have learned the ethic that's been around for a long time. Yeah, and it, I think it's interesting that even in like traditional journalism, no one has ever been clear that you know there are some magazines or newspapers that will say, look, anything over twenty-five or fifty dollars you can't accept. And there are some magazines where if you want to fly a travel writer to Fiji, you know, or uh, you know London to check out a new hotel, they can accept that and and not necessarily disclose that that was a paid trip. So I think it happens on both sides of the fence. Well, one of the wrinkles in this is that it's um, hard to know when you're being corrupted. Um, so you may think that it doesn't... Because everyone thinks they're incorruptible. Um, yes, and in fact. Uh, so you think that this is not affecting you, and in fact it turns out maybe it did. So maximum transparency is the only... You know, more transparency than you think is required. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you, if you wonder at all, should I disclose this, the answer is always yes. <laughs> Question. Well, David, you brought up um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's speech on Thursday. Um, there's a lot of consternation about save the internet and whether or not net neutrality is an issue or a non-issue. So when Doc started talking about telecommunication influence, I mean, that's a strong force lobbying in Washington and trying to address its needs, you know, vis-a-vis -vis our needs as netizens, if you will. So I guess my question is, um, should we still be very concerned about uh, save the internet, or is net neutrality more of an issue that's trumped up to create anxiety? I mean, I get petitions from Detroit Free Press all the time, and of course I sign them, and, but I, I really wonder. I, I'll jump in real quick. And I, I think net neutrality is, is, a, is a great principle. I, I, I question whether it's enforceable or even definable enough to turn into, into law, and that's made it really hard to argue. Um, I don't think what we're, what, are, what we're at risk of losing is not so much net neutrality as the net itself, as, mm -hmm. as, a, as a place that's not under corporate control, that's not under the control of special interests uh, in Hollywood or any place else. And, and to me, that's, it's sort of, my concern about arguing about net neutrality is that there are a whole bunch of people like, I'm for it, I'm against it. It's kind of, it's kind of like arguing the color blue or something. It, it's, it's not the right, it, it's, to me, it's, it's almost the wrong, it's, it's, it's a red herring in a way, even though I think it's an important thing 
it's not the most important thing, and it's a distraction. It's become a distraction. So I, I, I completely disagree with you. Here you go. I was hoping. To. <laughs> All right, this is going to get really disagree. uncivil really quick. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Well, unfortunately, I don't completely really disagree with that. Because the part that I agree with, I think, is a very important point, is that the net, net neutrality um, is, a requ from my point of view, is uh, a requirement because of the deficiency of the current way that we deliver the internet that Doc has, my point of view, again, accurately characterized. Um, we need net neutrality because the same people who are providing net access to us are also trying to sell us their services, their, their, uh, their programs, their content, and that is a too much of a temptation for the access providers. They are going to want to prefer that their voice over IP works better, that their Hollywood movies arrive before our YouTubes do, and so forth. Uh, it's just too much of a temptation. So we need net neutrality because we've smooshed together uh, the, uh, how stuff is delivered and who gets to sell over it. In a better world, and this is the argument, one of the arguments that we should be having, but it's too hard to have in this political environment, we should be looking for structural separation, from my point of view, where those who provide bits, provide bits, and that's it. They're not also selling you the pictures and the video and the rest of it. Um, and then you have a competition among people who are providing your bits to do what you want a competition to do, namely, oh, I can sell you more bits cheaper, faster. Open bits, use them for whatever you want. And anybody who has a movie can use those bits and move them around. So net neutrality seems to me to be absolutely uh, crucial because we are in a particular situation. Um, it is a suboptimal situation. It's the wrong way, of, of, from my point of view, of, of delivering the internet. Given that that's where we are, I think we need to push hard on net neutrality, even though, like free speech, it's hard to define exactly. So I also agree with Bob. Yeah. So that wasn't much of a disagreement. Well, yeah. yeah. I, I, to, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strategic and tactical problem at the moment. But I, in my ideal world, I would have structural separation as well, and I would, I would say, you know, it would be ideal if the Fed said to Comcast, okay, you want to buy NBC? you got to give up your pipes. Okay? If you want to be in the content business, then you can't be in the shipping business. Yeah. And, and separating those two... <coughs> well, it'd be interesting, yeah. It'd be interesting to see, like, how that stuff would... How that sort of uh, policy would start applying to Google, right? You know, because they've been going in the opposite direction. There. Google is, like Apple, is an example only of itself mm -hmm. and, uh, and a real... It's so anomalous, it's really, really hard to say how you would govern that. Yeah. But I just mean, uh, you know, the trend, you know, obviously under Bush and now under Obama, still under Obama, has been kind of more agglomeration as opposed yeah. to... Uh, but they're still selling a service, they're not selling access. So the, the day that Google, you can get your internet through Google, mm -hmm. so maybe, you know, then net neutrality needs to apply hard to them. Because Yahoo better arrive as quick, results from Yahoo better arrive as quickly as they arrive from Google. Right. If we're getting access, uh, if Google enters with Comcast and Verizon and AT&T. Right. And, and already we're there because Google has, here's what Google pays to ship out YouTube. Nothing. And that's because they peer. They're, and peering is based the, the, among the backbone companies on traffic, not on, on the capacity of the device. And because they have an enormous amount of traffic, they can say to, to level three or some other company, hey, we're getting this for nothing, okay? We're going to trade out. We're going to peer with you. They're already an advantage there. I'm not even sure Microsoft or Yahoo competes with this. Mm -hmm. You know, unless they build giant servers and they serve giant content at the same time. That, too, is a structural issue that has to be so sorted out. Uh, is there one? Well, there are a bunch of them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering your thoughts on... Um, uh, cyber threats, particularly of, of the large scale. Uh, when I first heard about what was going on in China with Google, um, I think the news first came out that it sounded like there was this huge attack on 10 major technology corporations, including Google. Um, it didn't turn out quite that way, but it could have. And, and you know, we have a very um, visible military that's supposed to protect our own country. Um, should we have visible cyber or cyber military that does the same type of thing? Or do we have to be concerned with this at all? Somebody has to be concerned with it. I don't know. Uh, Anybody like the it. last person to like want uniformed cyber police, you know, patrolling the, uh, you know, Starbucks where people are using Wi-Fi or, you know, Yeah, but that's not exactly airport. how it would work, I think. So uh, <laughs> yeah, larger scale attacks. I mean, 
Do you think, I, I mean, I guess the question is really, do we, I mean, yeah, do we need more protection against... I think we sort of have them. I mean, there, you know, there certainly are laws, pro, you know, prohibiting this. Um, and it's not like Google is not without its own law, in a way. I mean, they have enforcement powers. That they can say to China, we're going away. That's the kind of enforcement. Um, the interesting thing to me about the, the China situation is that, and this hasn't been talked about that much, um, uh, a colleague of ours, Rebecca McKinnon, brought it up. Um, and, uh, and a guy named Johnny, who's a Chinese blogger, um, who also is a very brought it up as well, which is, it's going to be really hard for Google to be a Chinese company. What they want, it can't be Biden. They're, they're not going to tell their 700 employees, censor everything and give us how. It's constitutionally very difficult for them, as well as just morally important. It's going to be very difficult for them to actually do it. Um, and that's, you know, and, and the Chinese model of, of nationalizing the net and saying we can't be on it is very much a model for a lot of other countries right now. You know, we look at it as something that's horrible, but other places say, that's great, hey, look, China's doing this, they're, they're locking it down, we can do the same thing. So, uh, just in a, in a sentence, um, I have talked with cyber security people whose judgment I trust, and they're, they think the threat is very real, immediate, happening now, and that we ought to be alert. Um, I don't know anything about uh, cyber security, though, so I can't respond to except to pass along that bad news. Dave so. Weinberg is <laughs> using his anonymity to pretend he doesn't work for the federal government. Right? Uh, let's take one more question, and then we'll move on to the uh, Ignite Talks. I'd be curious to hear your um, comments on Oracle's acquisition of Sun and um, the EEC's antitrust um, department just recently, a couple days ago, approved it. Um, I guess they were concerned about MySQL and what's going to happen with that, and supposedly Oracle gave them enough assurances that MySQL can be developed. But obviously MySQL is the foundation behind uh, WordPress along with, you know, dozens and hundreds of other open source projects. And I wonder what your reaction is to that. I, that's a great one. I'm, I'm not worried about MySQL. Um, I think that MySQL, because it's an open source project, if Oracle decides it's going to not work on it, so what? You know, you, you guys that are working on WordPress, take, you know, learn, learn MySQL. Hijack it, take it off, work it, take it off in some other direction on your own. Um, uh, Monty and David, the guys who created it in the first place, are very eager to get their hands back on it and stuff like that. Um, I'm not actually worried about that. I actually don't want to see the feds involved in it. If Oracle wants to, I mean, Sun has got it already anyway. Most of these people have left. You know, they bought a hardware business. They've, they've gotten that MySQL, the corporate side of that, and the, fact, the, the open source side of it is still around. So I'm not particularly concerned about that. I should mention, before we're out of time, uh, there is this great 10th anniversary edition of Food Train Manifest, uh, which is available in fine bookstores. The original is open for free. Uh, <laughs> I did notice that. Yeah, that I wasn't sure if you wanted to mention that. Yeah, they believe in the, the freemium business model. Uh, so thank you guys for your time. Thank you for all the great questions.